Uh, my name is Megan McLeod, and I am a rising senior at the University of Mississippi, and I'm studying economics. I am pre-med as well. I'm actually applying this cycle, so I'm definitely very appreciative of this specific webinar series um, and all of the things that I've learned from that, which is awesome, or any of you guys applying this cycle too. Looks like some people are typing. Yes. Okay, awesome. Yay. So exciting. <laughs> Can't believe we're close to the application being open for submissions already. It's kind of nuts. All right. Well, while we're waiting for just a couple more people, um, I will give you guys just a couple of announcements. First of all, if you're not on the Pre-Med Star site already, you definitely need to join. Um, it's an awesome community of pre-meds from all around the country, and you definitely get the opportunity to network with other people, see what other people are doing, um, help each other out in the forums. And we also have an awesome component called MChat where you can uh, go into a little chat section and talk to people who are studying for the MCAT and get some awesome advice. So that's definitely a great thing that we have on there as well. And I know one component of the Pre-Med Star site that I've really loved, um, especially with my AMCAS application, is being able to build a pre-med portfolio. So you get to keep track of all of the important things. And that's definitely, if you haven't filled out AMCAS yet, you will definitely see when the time comes. It's important to keep track of all those things. So yes, definitely a great feature, as Auburn said. All right, now on to a couple of announcements. So first thing is, um, if you get up to on the site, there are things called activity points. So for engaging with other people or posting in the forums, you get activity points. And once you get up to 500 of those, you'll get a free Kaplan self-paced online biochem or behavioral science course. And you can check your points by going to your own profile page. And you'll see in the upper right hand corner how many points you have total and how many you had last week. So definitely check that out. It's a great, great resource if you haven't taken the MCAT yet. And also, we have a full, free, comprehensive MCAT course that we're going to give away. And um, the way that you win that is by inviting as many people as you can to join PreMedStar. So all you have to do is go onto the site, and on the right-hand side, you'll see the invite features. And so you can invite people via Facebook or email. Um, it's very, very easy to do, but make sure you do it through the site. And if you go ahead and invite everyone kind of on your listservs for PreMed clubs, definitely a great way to get ahead of the game. So make sure you do that. Um, and we will be announcing that in mid-June is the winner of that giveaway is. So I believe we are going to show a video here really quickly. Oh, there we go. Hey, Pre-Med Star, hey, pre we're raffling away a free Kaplan MCAT prep course. Here's how it works. For each student you get to join Pre-Med Star, you get a ticket entered into the raffle. Remember, in order for us to give you credit, you have to log in to Pre-Med Star and use one of our invite features. It's really easy, and you can even post Facebook invitations from there. Oh, and here's a tip to help you win. Invite your entire Pre-Med Club. We're super excited and can't wait to give one of you this free MCAT prep course. See you online at PreMedStar.com. All right, awesome. So super easy, as you can see. Definitely want to win that uh, comprehensive MCAT course if you haven't taken the MCAT yet. So I'll go ahead and introduce Erica then, since she is our main event. We're very excited to have her help us out on how to write an excellent personal statement. For those of us who are applying this cycle, that is certainly an important component of the application. So Erica is a rising first year medical student and she is also a clinical research coordinator in the Young Adult and Family Center at the University of California, San Francisco, where she helps to coordinate outpatient mental health services and research studies for young adults. She earned her master's degree at the University of Michigan School of Public Health and her bachelor's in public health at UC Berkeley. So welcome Erica. Okay, all right, this is fantastic. We will go ahead and get started now. 
Um, first and foremost, I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties, folk. Um, it looks like my laptop is not as extravagant as the refurbished purchase would allow you to believe. Who do not believe Best Buy when they allow you to purchase something refurbished? Just to let you know, it's bad. Um, so here's what we're going to do, folks. Um, I'm really just here to talk you all through a little bit of the process of telling your story in general, right? And so right now, I presume that a majority of you have already finished your personal statement, so I am going to spend time on it for those who have not started it. Don't worry. Don't panic. It's okay. Um, but I am going to make this inclusive of where you are. <laughs> it's good to talk. No worries, Vincent. We'll get you up to par. Um, I do also want to be cognizant of the fact that there's many opportunities to tell your story in this process of applying to medical school. And so throughout the duration of the presentation, I will also cover your secondary applications, a second point in which you're going to be telling your story, writing your narrative, and the third part is the meaningful activities and the, and the special meaningful activities portion on the AMCAS application. And so I hope this, this presentation is going to be inclusive, relevant, um, feel free to go ahead and add in questions in the in the chat box for the structure of this presentation just because we are starting a little bit late. I'm going to try and hold all the questions till the end, but feel free to ask them in the chat box and then at the end, of course, reiterate if I don't get to them during the Q&A portion. And so here we go. Next slide, if I remember how to do this. Great. Let's start off. And Yes, so this webinar is going to be available, first of all, on YouTube in a couple of days after this presentation, and I believe it's going to be housed on the PreMedStar website. But Dr. Dale can go ahead and correct me if that's incorrect. All right, so we have about 30 minutes or less. I'm going to get through all of this content for you all and make sure to highlight the important points. Here is the agenda. We're going to talk about per the personal statement, of course. Um, I'm going to talk about tips and tra traps. Now, just to give you all a very honest, transparent answer, I did not make this stuff up. And if I did, you should be very cautious because I'm not all medical schools. And so I gathered a lot of this information from other resources that I've tapped into, other admissions people that I've spoken with, other pre-med resources about writing a personal statement in your narrative as well. So I'm going to be referencing them throughout the course of the presentation. Second is the AMCAS Works and Activities section. The Works and Activities section, like, like I said, is a second part where you're going to be telling a little bit more of who you are. It's basically kind of an expanded resume portion. And within that respect, I'm also going to be touching on the meaningful experiences in which the AMCAS allows you an additional several characters to talk a little bit more in depth about some activities that you've listed. And then I'll go into the secondary application, talk a little bit about trips, uh, about the, excuse me, the tricks, the things to keep in mind when writing that, and then I'll end with questions. Now, there is my little friend. If you all tuned in to the last the last webinar facilitated by Omen VA. Um, I we do love these bitmojis and this my little friend here, I'm gonna call her Ruth, which is actually a friend of mine. I'm gonna call her Ruth St. Fort specifically. So Ruth here is going to give us um just t things to very, very, very much keep in mind. If I do not say something, Ruth is gonna remind me to emphasize it in this presentation. So look out for Ruth here in the corner. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Anne. I know you know her. Look out for Ruth in the corner. She's going to be highlighting some specific points if I don't get to them or if I forget to mention them. <laughs> All right. All right. So first and foremost, personal statement. And just note I may do a little bit of slide reading here, but I think there's some points that I really want to get across. So the personal statement, of course, this is an area in which you are going to be indicating why you are interested in, in pursuing a career as a physician. Bear in mind, this is literally one of the most important aspects of the personal statement. And so it's important to say that as transparently as possible. This is also the part in the application in which the medical school is going to be influenced. You can talk about your influences, your inspirations, and your motivations to pursue this career. Everyone's personal statement will be different based off of that. Next, you're going to be highlighting experiences that have helped you confirm this and confirm that the, fact, the fact that this is the right choice and trajectory for you. So that's the purpose. In terms of the preparation stages, and I'll go into this a little bit more in depth as we continue, the 
the, pre, the personal statement process is literally a process of writing and ex, self-exploration because at this point in time, we're asking you to think about why you're trying to pursue a career in medicine. So on average, 8 to 12 drafts. It may be more, maybe less, but basically this is just to let you know people spend a lot of time and have a lot of different drafts and variations of their story. Um, here's other prepar preparatory tips. Be introspective. And by introspective, I mean like Drake. You want to think very hard about the reasons that have got you to this point and be very reflective about them as you move forward. So in that respect, let's, little get, let's, little, let's get a little bit more honest here. We want to avoid superficial and obvious statements. It is true that all of us want to help people. That is true. And it's something that right when someone asks you why you want to be a physician, you may be tempted to say because it's true. But I want to tell you that is thematic amongst everybody. Like I said initially, the personal statement is specific to you. There's nothing in your personal statement that I'm going to be able to literally extrapolate from someone else's. So for that reason, we want to avoid superficial and obvious statements. Next, we want to include lessons that you've learned in your various experiences. So if you are like me, you have had a colorful journey into medicine, and some things may not be things that you want to highlight, some bad grades here, some disciplinary action there. Okay, we're going to talk about how you discuss those aspects in your personal statement, but it's important to know we're talking about them reflectively as lessons you learned. We're not going to ruminate on how this made you feel in that moment. We're going to talk about what you gleaned from that situation, what you learned from that failure, what you learned from that mishap from being fired, and how this is going to make you a better physician and a better applicant for their medical school. Um, in that respect, we're going to present challenges that you may, have, you may have had to overcome in your life, and there's a diverse array of types of challenges in a matter-of-fact tone. So bear in mind, folks, it's really all about tone here. Everyone's story is going to be very different, but it's how you present your story that's going to be the most meaningful. Now, that's the last of the preparatory steps. The, in terms of presentation, and everything is going to be kind of broken down into purpose, prepare, and present. The personal statement is 5,300 characters with spaces. If you are me, then you did this 5,300 without spaces, and you felt great until you realized you were about 200 words too wordy. So with spaces, it's important to keep that in mind. Literally, AMCAS will take out the last several hundred characters if they don't align, so keep that in mind in terms of the writing process. Look, it's Ruth. Hey, Ruth, what you say? All right, here's the first tip, everybody. Practice makes perfect. Writing this personal statement may come easy to some, and for others it may be very difficult. And I would say it should be a challenge. It should be something that causes you to really reflect on your experiences. So the question that some people may have is, how do you even get started writing the statement, right? Where do I start? So here's a couple exercises to, to get back into the writing process in terms of being reflective and sincere and meaningful. First and foremost, a very small thing to do is journal and reflect daily. This is something that I've heard from many people and I did myself and I was getting back into the mode of writing. Taking time to literally spend five to ten minutes every day to reflect on an activity or experience and talk about it with description will help you get back into the flow of writing. It essentially is kind of like practicing for an endurance race. You want to practice a little bit at least in the beginning just to get your body in the flow and the feel of that exercise. It's the exact same thing with writing. It's going to be very frustrating to sit down and try and write a personal statement in a day, right? So how do we do that? We practice being reflective and thoughtful of our experiences. If you sit down two, five days out of the week and you write down something that happened to you that day, why it mattered to you, then you're going to notice your ability to think about your experiences, to express them using words, prose. You're going to understand and feel this more easily than if you try and do it very abrupt. Second is what I like to call read a bit, write a lot. The more you read, the more you're going to see how people express themselves. And I want to tell you all this because it's a really, really small trick. Before I started writing my personal statement, I would take time to read other people's narratives in different ways. I started reading more blogs. I started reading more short stories. I started reading more news articles every day. Why? Because you want to see how other people tell their stories. You want to see how other people tell stories in general. It may give you a better sense and better ideas and creative juices about how you may want to express yourself. And especially 
especially if you feel stuck in terms of how do I talk about this really terrible thing that happened to me. I say take a minute and go go read a blog. Go 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 read a news article. It may help the creative juices in terms of seeing how other people express themselves. And the second particular exercise I would say I like to call talk therapy. We can do this in two ways, people. First, talk therapy to somebody else. This is a practice that one of my mentors did with me when I was stuck. She literally asked me the question on the personal statement, but she had me tell it, she had me relate it to her as though it was a conversation. Erica, why are, why are you interested in health? In that respect, I literally told her. I talked to her as though it was a conversation, told her a story, and she literally took notes on everything that I said. It's a good idea to make this a good friend of yours. You don't want to do it to someone who doesn't like you. You don't know what they're going to say. But it's important that this, this is, a, I think, a really good advantage to using your own voice to try and tell stories because sometimes it can get frustrating to literally try and write this out initially. It may be easier to just talk it out. Literally have someone you care about ask you the questions. And let's even make this simpler. If the question is, why are you interested in medicine, which is essentially what the personal statement prompt is, let's say you have people ask you, what are some things you're interested in doing in life? How did they help you get to this subsequent point? How does this relate to health? How does it relate to medicine? Break up the question a little bit and make it more of a conversation. All right. Next talk therapy is talk to yourself. It's, it works, okay? Maybe you want to tape it. You have a recorder, you have a recording device on most mobile phones. Why, do, why not just try and literally orate the personal statement to yourself? Then you can go back and listen to it. Get in the practice of hearing your own story, at least to yourself. And the last I will say is make a list, check it twice. Find out what's nice. Basically, make a list of all your experiences and spend time talking about them. Spend time writing, spend time writing them. And you'll find that if you do so, you may realize different, ex- different emotions and attribute it to different experiences that you otherwise weren't aware of. All right, um, I want to go into the chat real quick because I see a question specifically targeted towards me, um, and it says, does it hurt to start with humor in a personal statement? That is a fantastic question, and I will say, you know what? It's unique. If it's unique to you and we can pull it off, then why not? It's risky. Many things in a personal statement are risky, but all of it is about how you're going to deliver the personal statement as a whole. Everybody has a different story, and I'll get into trans- get into that in, a, in the, I think, the next two slides. And so using humor, using a quote, using different things of that nature, sure, they may be a really unique approach that helps you tell your story in a way that's, so di- that's very distinct. All right. Now I'll transition to the next slide. And so this is some more tips for the personal statement to keep in mind. First and foremost, like I said, it's a narrative. We already talked about that. You're going to describe why you want to be a physician as opposed to other professions. Now, we only want to, you don't want to spend too many characters defending yourself against the world if it's not you. But some another approach that people recommend is if you are going to say, I guess, more things that are more cliche or can be attributed to many different kinds of health professions, it's important to designate why this is a physician. For example, if your personal statement is a narrative talking about how you love caring for children, how you love teaching them about themselves, and how you feel that you're just naturally connected, then I can read that and say, does she want to be a teacher? (laughs) I can't tell. And that's fine, which is to say we want to make sure that your personal statement is explaining why you want to be a physician. Does that make sense? Next, um, be explicit. Like I said, avoid cliches, ramblings, and generalizations. Here's, here's the reality, and everyone on this chat who knows me knows that I am a chatty patty, and I can talk a whole lot and say very little sometimes, unfortunately. That was an issue that I had with my personal statement. There was a lot of fluff initially. There's a lot of just words around words around words. Thank you, Omidivia. And so in that respect, we want to avoid generalizations, abstract concepts, and ramblings that may be important to you, but other people may not really get unless they know you. And that's the part that's going, that part is going to be properly edited from the following point that I want to emphasize, which is have someone look at your statement. Someone who does not know you as well because they are going to be helped judge it based off of clarity and 
understanding of what you're trying to relay without being connected to you and knowing how to fill in the dots. All right. Now let's go a little bit. Oh, Ruth has something else to say. Um, okay, Ruth, what do you have to say? What is the magic number here? And so I say that in the respect of people ask me all the time, how many people should look at my personal statement? Two, four, six, should I just send it to a listserv? These are great questions. I've, see, I've kind of used some research to categorize the amount of people based off of where they fall into in these little brackets. In terms of who should look at your statement, the first type of person to look at your statement is someone who knows you. Mind you, all of these can be overlapping individuals as well, but let's keep them discreet for the moment. Who should look at your statement? First, someone who knows you, someone who's close to you. This person has the sole purpose of editing your statement for clarity and correctness for your story. If you say you're born in Minnesota and your sister says, actually, I think you were born in California, you should take that out. That's something that someone else may be able to catch who knows you. So for that reason, someone who knows you can be a very important asset to telling your story. They can literally help you shape they can help you shape your narrative based off of facts that are true for you. They can help gauge it based off sincerity and tone. This doesn't sound like you. You sound kind of more like you're, you're ruminating and you're grieving in this state, but you're not talking about how victorious you are. We should, you should change it to more reflect that tone. The second kind of person is someone who does not know you. This is fear not, fear not, fear not. We're going to get through this together. I just saw that comment. I had to comment because I feel for you. Um, someone who does not know you has the sole purpose of reading your essay and providing feedback related to clarity, understanding, and meaning. Essentially, you have a bird's eye view of your story. They can help to determine this doesn't make sense. I don't really know you, but I just know that none of these facts align in a way that makes sense. And this is specifically important because the people who read your statement will not know you. They won't know how to fill in the dots. They won't know that you're being sarcastic. They won't know how to glean those little in-between-the-lines phrases and ideas. So someone who doesn't know you is a second classification of person that's important to read your statement. The third is an experienced reviewer. This, everyone is one of the huge assets and benefits and blessings of an SNMA because a majority of students have been on the admissions committee at one point. And so even if you don't have anyone in your network, come to SNMA, come to Pre-Med Star. This is what we're trying to do, is connect you to people who have been decision makers in the past. I think this is one of the more important people to read your statement because they can read it based off of the criteria of what it looks like to get in? What are some important things to keep in mind? This is something that we're actively trying to do by connecting you with SNMA reviewer mentors to connect you with someone who's been in the decision-making seat before and knows from their end what's important to see in a statement. So all in all, have at least one person from each category. That's my general recommendation at least one person from each category. You can have more, but he, of course, as you all know, because you've graduated from an undergraduate university or are still there, many people who provide a lot of feedback can create a lot of noise, and they can drown out your own sound, if you will. So for that reason, I try and restrict it to about three people. You can have more if you feel it's necessary, but make sure there is a saturation point, if you will. Shout out to chemistry. There is a saturation point. There's a point in which everyone's feedback is just going to create an essay that's not yours anymore. So about three is essentially a good idea. That's okay. And all right, so here's the next point. Oh, and to, to comment on your now kind of look at the questions here, how can you find a reviewer for free? Um, Anana, I believe you're, you're, you're and let me know if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, we're trying to connect people in SNMA who are med students who potentially have been a reviewer at one point in time or are currently reviewers. So being a part of Pre-Med Star and being a part of this boot camp is one great way to find a reviewer. Literally, I do believe Omnivier sent an email a few hours ago asking if you are interested in being paired with someone because we are going to help you find someone. So we're one, a one-stop shop. All right. Now, um, here's personal statement traps. Um, bear in mind, here's another plug. A lot of these facts came from the University of Washington SNMA U Prep Guide, the great guide on personal statement writing and application. So I give a shout out to them. Here's some traps, folks. 
walking through your resume, trap on the personal statement. You know why I know? Because that was one of my first three statements. I literally talked about my resume a lot. It's not a good idea. Why? You already have your resume, and you're going to have the meaningful activities talk a little bit more about it. The personal statement is where you talk about your motivation, influences, and experiences that have led you to want to pursue a career in medicine. Not everything that you happen to do because you were in college or the job that you had so you can pay for this and that. Don't talk about your resume. You can't highlight experiences on it. I'm not saying that there may be experiences on your resume that are particularly meaningful. Of course, include those. But don't make your personal statement a literally an expanded resume. Um, next thing, talking about your proficiency in science in the school, it's another temptation. It's not necessarily the best idea. Talking about why you're the best in organic chemistry and this is why you should be a physician, it's not a selling point. You're being the best in organic chemistry is a blessing, and I will call you in general, but the, the school wants to see why you're going to be a great applicant in a great medical student and physician later on. So talking about your natural proficiency or propensity to do well academically is not a part of your personhood. Next, and this is an important point, trying to show growth by focusing on what you did wrong to start. This is something that I think is tricky for a lot of students like myself who had many what we will call slip-ups in the process of applying to medical school. Don't feel tempted to overly emphasize or overly ruminate on the negative experiences. The two things that we already said are we want to talk about things in a matter-of-fact tone and we want to talk about the lessons learned. Matter of fact, this happened. Lesson learned, this is what I grew from that, and this is how I grew from that situation, which is to say, yes, you can, talk, you can mention an academic situation in which you didn't do well. Why? Because that's a part of your story. That's a part of your personhood. However, we're not going to spend a majority of characters talking about this negative thing. A majority of our characters should be focused on the positive aspects of who we are, which is to say, after you mention something, we're going to talk about the lessons that we learned from it in a matter-of-fact tone. All right. Looking through, I appreciate all this, the peer support that everyone's doing in the, in the chat room, so I'll continue to move forward. So here is our smart art of the personal statement writing process. And this is actually more of a circle. Actually, it's more of a figure eight. It's more of an infinity sign. But I made it a line because it's a line. So here's how we recommend to get this started. Pick a theme. I'll talk about themes in a minute. Pick a theme, a theme that helps to align with your story. Identify two to three experiences that align with that theme. I didn't say four, five, six, seven, eight, and 12. Two to three, maybe three to four. We don't have a lot of space. Remember, only 5,300 characters with spaces. So we don't have a lot of time to talk about every single thing that you've ever done in your life. That's okay. Next, create an outline. After we pick a theme, decide the story that we want to tell, we identify experiences that align with that theme, then we're going to create an outline for how we want to tell that story. If we want to do it chronologically, that's one approach. If we want to do it starting in the present and moving, to, and moving backwards retrospectively, that's another approach. If we want to talk about it in the future tense and talk backwards, that's another approach. So using, creating an outline is important. Next, this is just a part of the writing process, come up with a hook necessarily. If you're like me, actually maybe your introductory paragraph is the last thing you write about. So maybe at this point in time, come up with a, a a gripping, evocative hook that people are interested in reading from the jump and want to continue to read throughout. Now, we're going to get feedback. Now, this part, I've invited people with the feedback towards the end of this process because feedback too early may confuse, frustrate, and disengage you. So at this point in time, after you've picked a theme, you've written about a couple experiences, outlined this in a good format, created a nice evocative hook, then we're going to ask people to come in and join in and to, to provide their opinion. At this point in time, if the things align, you are done. If this did not align with you because you are me, then maybe you have a couple more iterations of this, and that's okay. But it's at least good to have a structure or format that you're going to use as your guiding principle moving forward. Now that we've talked about the process, let's – now here's Ruth again. Ruth, 
what's in a theme? That's a great question, Ruth. So the theme is, I think, a very interesting and important point that has been recommended to me by a lot of different people because there's a lot of different stories to who you are, but we don't have a lot of space to talk about all of them. So a theme basically helps to organize your ideas and your experiences. One example of what's an example of a theme when it comes to a personal statement? Well, one theme is I'm a resilient person. This is a theme. My life is a story of resilience. I'm going to tell you why now. I'm going to spend the next 5,299 characters telling you why I'm resilient. I'm a dedicated person. This is why. I love kids. This is why. I like taking care of other people. This is why. I love sports medicine. This is why. Basically, this, this process, I think, can become very confusing and disengaging when you're trying to find a way to really encapsulate all of who you are into one short essay. So how do we go about doing this? Pick one theme from your life because it's going to make this essay so much more powerful, potent, and clear. I'm not saying that there's not multiple themes. Everyone, there's so many, there's so many different aspects of your identity and your story, and they may intertwine so very well, and they do, and we want to hear about it. But oftentimes when you're writing this statement and you try to incorporate so many different aspects of who you are, it can get confusing and leave all your stories fragmented. You may just have to highlight something that happened instead of literally emphasizing what it meant to you. So for that reason, we use themes as our guiding principle in selecting the types of experiences that we want to include and the meaning that we extracted from those experiences. Now, I'll continue to the next slide. And so this, I believe um, someone asked a question a little bit earlier about humor, and I want to thank you so much for that question because I think whenever I go to personal statement workshops or read blogs or anything like that, my question is, so how do you start this? That's a real question. You get a lot of advice about what to do, what not to do, but really, what's a, how can I start this, literally? So I also, again, shout out to the University of Washington SNMA U Prep Guide, and they had a nice article about quick attention grabbers um, and ways to begin a topic. And I want to encourage everybody, go ahead and just quickly check this out because it's really interesting. Now, here's, here's what we have. We have the topic is morning blah, morning blah. And that's just to say your everyday, natural, nondescript morning. There's so many different ways to talk about that morning. You'd be surprised. First and foremost, question. How can getting out of bed at 7.30 a.m. be so unexciting? Now, what about a quote? Life can be made easier for one teenage person if he makes himself get up in the morning. That's what my mother said. What about a definition? What's confusion? It's the utter chaos given in the morning. What about a startling statement? I live in the middle of a war zone. Series of facts, anecdotes, metaphors, all of these are different examples and different ways to be creative in talking about your story. Now, I think for a lot of people in the room or in the chat room who may be creative writers or English majors or anything of the sort, being very creative and descriptive comes naturally. But for a lot of us, we're not used to being, except for me and you're dramatic, as people say, you're not used to being really overly verbose about your experiences. Maybe you're just used to saying, the dog is brown, and I walked past him, and that's okay. Well, this is your time to be a little bit more expressive about your experiences. So for that reason, taking the time to go through the different ways to tell your story different literary techniques can set your story apart because there's aspects of your story that to you may seem pretty humdrum, maybe run in the mill. And if we augment that a little bit, if we make it into, as someone else commented, more of a humorous tone, if you start off, the story, if you start off your essay with, let's say, uh, a question, starting off with a quote from, from, a very, from a famous figure from your grandmother, it may be a way to really draw in the reader. Um, in a way that you may, may not be used to. So that's another point. And I'm just going to briefly look at the chat room. Looks like people are self-sufficient, so I will keep moving. All right. Now that we've kind of gone through personal statement, 
and of course, again, just to reiterate, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to keep including them in the chat room and see that people are really doing doing a great form of support and, and answering questions. But if you want me to go back to personal statement, I'm, I'm welcome. To, I'm ready to do so. And I think actually at this point in time, I'll take the time to revisit that. Does anyone have any questions specifically about the personal statement that they would like me to respond to? And I'll just look in the chat room for a second. Okay, see none. Poor grades. Great question. Poor grades. All right. Poor grades. That's a great question, Mr. All right. Poor grades. That's an example of what we call the minor slip-ups that happen in your life, which are not going to determine who you are because you're still an amazing perfect victor. Poor grades, if you want to mention them, and I would say at times maybe poor grades if there's a series of them. If you're highlighting one class in the broad scheme of your entire four years of coursework that things didn't go well, that I would say is more of a punitive punishment for yourself, really trying to get the reader to draw in on this one thing that you didn't do well. But let's say it was a semester in which, you, which your, your grades were somewhat dissimilar from the rest of your trajectory, and you want to make sure that the reader knows this is something that happened to me and I grew from it. Now let's talk about poor grades. So first, consider the context. If you're, if you're going to highlight one individual isolated incident that doesn't seem to be connected to anything, it's what we call maybe an outlier even. Maybe I just didn't study for this exam. I failed. It was terrible. I retook it. I feel great. The reader, can, you can, the, reader will, the, the reviewer will extract that in terms of looking at your overall context. If your series of poor grades are actually a collection of them, they took place at a point in your life, and at this point in time, we want to speak to that. We don't want to ignore whole periods where see, things seem to be very different from our other periods. So yes, in that case, I would say mention it. But don't exclusively focus on the grades. Focus on the context of this experience, which is to say, at this time, I wasn't doing well academically. You don't have to say I got a 70 Two percent. You don't have to say I have a 19% in this class. You can just say I wasn't doing well academically. Explain why in a matter-of-fact tone and what we learned from that incident, all encapsulated within the context of that experience. Does that answer your question, Victor? Okay. Two semesters of poor grades. Okay, great. Perfect, perfect. And with regards to the theme, if I choose I'm resilient, here's why. Would I be on, of course, by talking about why I'm resilient and not why I want to practice medicine? That's a great question. So resiliency, think about resiliency as the mode of transportation to get you to the store. You can take a bike, you can take a scooter, you can take a car. It's just a mode of transportation. Resiliency is our mode of transportation in discussing why we want to do medicine. So in this case, you will still talk about why you want to do medicine. Resiliency is just going to help you select the stories that make the most sense. Because basically, if you think about this, even though people, I didn't believe people in this initially when I noticed, oh, your life actually is kind of a bit of a line. It's a lot of different dots. It's a scatter plot, but there is a trajectory. Because there's times when you could have taken this job or this job, and you chose A. And then when you got A, you chose three or four, and you chose four, and you could have, et cetera, et cetera. So which is to say you want to be able to focus on experiences that align with one core theme to get you to the point in discussing why you want to go into medicine, if that makes sense. So yes, you will absolutely be mentioning the fact that you are resilient. Resilient is going to be important because that's why you may talk about why you chose to be a director of a program, why your grades didn't did or didn't do extremely well in this semester, and why you currently do research, as opposed to saying that you wanted to talk about one shadowing experience and one different job. It's literally just going to help us shape how we are telling our story so we can still get to the destination that we want without a lot of noise. Does that make sense? That's a score. All right, fancy, fancy. Now I will continue to move forward and we'll go into works and activities. So works and activities, everyone, this is what I call a gift. There's less creativity in this section, folks. Why? Because there's not that many characters to get real fancy and to use a lot of rhymes. Purpose of the works and activities, so works and activities are, is a section on the AMCAS that, acts, that asks you to select works and activities that greatly align with pretty much medicine. Now, the reason why I say 
greatly align with medicine in terms of your medicine, not everybody's medicine, meaning you don't have to only talk about things that say health in the title, but literally you want to talk about things that uniquely shape your context and your path to medicine. So can Chatham be a part of those work experience? I sure hope so because it was a part of mine, Victoria. Um, yes, it can be. Shadowing, volunteers, jobs, if you babysat, if you if you went to a conference, if you presented at that conference, if you published at this conference, these can be three different experiences or one of them. So all of that is to say, in this category, when you get to the AMCAS, you're going to be asked to categorize your experiences yourself, which is the first gift. Because there's experiences where you may have been paid for research, and you can designate it as paid employment or research. The choice is yours. Now here's why this matters. You are going to diversify this experience as much as possible, meaning at the end of this, we're not going to say we, worked, we did 15 different research opportunities. It's okay. We get the idea. You like research. We, we, it makes sense. But if one thing is paid employment, if another opportunity is volunteer, show the gamut and diversity and I would say holistic aspects of your identity. So that is to say the whole purpose is to identify experiences that are meaningful to you, um, you, you identify 15 of them, and it asks you to indicate them in chronological order uh, and cannot be rearranged. The medical schools then sort through the activities and choose how they want to view them. Um, these activities, they ask you everything about if there was a supervisor, contact information. They ask you the whole gamut of them, the hours per week, week that you worked, start, start date, finish date, et cetera. So that's the, that's the preparation. Another preparation tip that I remember that I didn't include here is one thing that I, excuse me, was advised to do when I initially started this process was to make a very large Excel sheet of every single thing that I ever did. And this didn't, I didn't do this overnight. There was some, I took a week, some days I would just be riding on the bus and say, I forgot I did that thing, and I wrote it down. Then after I wrote that list down, I categorized them based off of the categories in the MCAS. I, just, I said this is paid employment and research and shadowing at the same time, et cetera. This allowed me to see how diverse my experiences were. And from that, I picked the ones that mattered the most to me. And by mattered the most, I mean when I can actually make more than three words. Of, I can actually use more than three words to describe them. So that's just a quick tip. Now, in terms of presentation, and, and by presentation, I mean how are we going to write this. Like I said, this is a gift because you don't have to be as colorful and as decorative and as expressive. So when we're writing our works and activities section, and this is just the basic 15 works and activities, not or 12, excuse me, well, 15 works and activities, not the three most meaningful. For that reason, prioritize describing the responsibilities that you had first before getting creative and eloquent with them. First, just tell me what this was. Don't go, don't specifically start talking about how this made you feel afterwards, the thoughts that you had walking home, um, what you went and did afterwards. No, no, no. First and foremost, keep in mind as a reviewer, I don't even know what you did. I don't really know exactly what the neuroblastoma bacillus caucus lab is. So before you start talking about how it influenced your desire to want to play with blastomas, tell me what you did. If you have space after that, if and only if, then you can dedicate time to discussing what you learned from that experience. But initially, we do not have a lot of space for a lot of creativity. We just want to know what you did. I worked in this lab doing this thing with this person, and these were my responsibilities. If you have an iota of space afterwards, and I liked it too. And I don't mean and I liked it too, but literally from this experience, I was able to learn kind of be a better communicator and relate to patients in from diverse communities, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we'll, now okay, the next part are the, the three experiences that can be designated as most meaningful. So this, and I see a couple questions arising from this as well, and, 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 and I do believe this is a problem that I had, a problem, but something that I ran into. From this, you're allowed to pick three meaningful activities and we spend more characters talking about them. And this is where you get colorful books. This is where you get expressive and you talk a little bit more about what's not only what you did, because we already learned about it, but you talk a little bit more about what it meant to you, what you learned from that experience, et cetera. So this is more of a mini essay style. You get three of these. Now to answer your question about the, and that's what I, I do think is an important thing to note. Can your meaningful activities 
be in your personal statement as well. Absolutely. There's very few things that you actually cannot do in this application. So in terms of what you can and cannot do, it will still let you press send. That is true. Now let's talk about why we may or may not want to try and include something. This, all of this that we're doing, this is the whole, this is the comprehensive profile of who you are until we get an interview. So because of that, we want to exhaust all the opportunities to talk about every aspect of who we are as much as possible. Now, if there's a way that you were able to talk more meticulously, more elaborately about this experience because you only kind of mentioned it in your personal statement, then sure, let's do that here. Because you, this is an experience where you're stating, I also want you to ask me about this thing. This is something that, keep in mind, it's meaningful to you, so it's fair game. In your interview, they may say, oh, Brooke, it looks like you used to raise seals. Can you tell me about that? Because you spent 750 characters talking about it. And Brooke, because you wrote that you like to raise seals, then they're going to, they expect it's something that you're passionate about. And if you are passionate about it, then you can speak about it with a lot more elaboration. So for that reason, yes, you can. However, if it's possible that you avoid it for, in order to leave room for different experiences, then please do so. If it's not avoidable for the reasons of, A, there's not that many experiences, which is possible, or two, this was actually very meaningful to you, then yes, include this. Because the most meaningful aspects of your, your profile will come up again. It will come up in an interview. It may come up in a MMI. It will come up in a lot of different ways. So keep that in mind. Now let's look at, okay, are there any more questions about that? I just want to make sure. Oh, maybe talk about volunteer experiences that wasn't related to medical school. Yes, 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 Aubrey, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, when I say be use diverse experiences, I mean that. I mean if you want to talk about one experience where you, one of my experiences, for example, was coaching a second and third grade girls basketball team. It was the highlight of my actual life. And I talked about that. I talked about what it meant to me to be able to teach a different population something about themselves. Okay, soccer coach. Okay. Hey, now. So, yes, talk about them. This is where the school is going to learn about you holistically. So, of course, mention medical things because that's why we're here and spend characters on that. But secondly, mention things that are going to, dis that are going to make you distinct from other individuals. Summer health programs can be categorized based off of anything that you did. I did a summer health program about research, so I categorized it as research. If your summer health program culminated in a symposium, mention the summer health program as kind of the background and the symposium as the conference presentation. So basically all that has to say, and that's a great question, Louisa, you're, we're going to take some some ownership over our activities. This is the first time where literally people are going to ask us, how do we want to define this thing? And so be very meaningful about that and create as colorful a plate as you possibly can with priority to health and medical things, and then making sure the rest of your plate is colorful with distinct categories of experiences. All right, now let's go into some other tips to include. Like I said, list activities not found anywhere else in your application, of course, as much as possible. But again, like I said, we only have so many activities. We also went to school, so they know we didn't do everything. So be real. But also, you'd be surprised the different creative ways you can define what you did if you sit and think about it. That's why I don't leave this till the last minute. And if you want any tips or help about how to make activities creative, you call us. We do this. Next, include what you learned from your experiences if you have the space. If you don't have the space, do not waste time because it's more important to find out what exactly you did. Then if you have space, we go into that. And lastly, put effort into your descriptions, which is to say you didn't manage everything. You didn't coordinate everything. You didn't oversee everything. Use that thesaurus when you can. Be a little bit more thoughtful. If there's if there's something if there's a form of if there's a data collection that you did, don't just say data collection. You can say I did, I I used a, a diverse sample of data. I I collected data in diverse populations. If you did research, what kind of research? Instead of just saying I did research, I performed qualitative research with young adults. 
I perform quantitative research with an elderly population. Be very sincere. Each word literally matters. So instead of just writing, I did research for fun and it was great. I did research with this person at this time for this period of time at this place. It gives, a bit, it gives it a bit more substance. And now the secondaries. Secondary, 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 secondary. Secondaries, everyone. Well, there's no pop-up for, for Ruth here, but I will definitely um, include a lot of just tips to keep in mind after we add this. So the tips, the secondary applications, first of all, are the, are the applications that a school sends out either automatically for some schools, or after you go through what we call a pre-screening process after you submit your primary application. Your primary application will be your personal statement, then your demographics, all of that information on either the AMCAS or the TEMDOS or the ACOMAS. That's your primary application. Your secondary application is received after the school sent gets all of that information. Here's two things to keep in mind. Your secondary application has many different forms, my friend, for every given school. And so some schools say you can submit your secondary application whenever you feel like it. Some schools say if you submit the secondary application a minute after 5 p.m., it will bounce right back to you. Some schools say I want it in two weeks, but I want it in one day. So which is to say pay attention to the school's to the school's recommendations, to their restrictions. That's very, very important for dates and deadlines. One quick, excuse me, my charter. Please. It's the beauty of a webinar. So some schools may be a little bit more liberal in that respect. One quick tip that I have and that we included in the previous webinar is to create an Excel sheet of every single secondary and application that you have, include the date that it's due and the date that you want to send it in. And this is going to go to the first, the quick tip. Turnaround time is usually two weeks or less. Two weeks or less formally or informally. Some schools may say that, some don't. Why does that matter, Erica? It matters because some schools have a rolling admission, meaning the sooner you get in, the sooner that they see you, the sooner you secure a spot. The longer you wait to send in your application, the more spots have already been given to other people. So meaning you're literally in a pool of more people applying but less vacant seats. The secondary application is key to this because this is where the school may ask you, for some universe, for some medical schools, 500 words about why you want to come to University X. And some schools have a little bit more of a specific type of question and answer, meaning tell us a time when you were a leader. Tell us a time when you did this activity. Why do you want to work in this community? So it can be a very, it can be more of a distinct but standardized way of assessing you once they figure out that your grades and your original, your primary application are up to par. Next, next tip, answer all the questions that they have. This is, I will be transparent with you all, as, as subjective as it is objective. I've heard people say hard and fast, answer every single question, and I've heard people say if the question doesn't apply to you, and of course some may not apply to you. Right? For example, if you took time off, discuss that here. If you've never taken time off, please do not respond in that category. But some schools may, and this is this ask you. This is an additional question where we want you to say share additional information about yourself. Take all the space you can if you can. I would recommend. Next, demonstrate fit for the school. I speak this from experience. People, they can see through the they can see through the clouds. You want to be very specific as possible. I want to go to your medical school because it exists in this state with this population, and this is what I want to do. I want to work with this person. I want to engage with this curriculum. Your mission and values align with me. Those are things that demonstrate the specificity of who you are with their school. For that reason, we say secondaries are important, and starting early is even more important because it's very difficult to be specific quickly and generally. Next, realize what makes you unique and diverse. Most secondaries, and you'll find this out as you're doing them, blend together. They blend together quite a bit. And so they'll probably ask you something about what makes you diverse for this school. Why do you want to be here? Um, well, how can you contribute to the diversity of our, of our learning environment? You are diverse. You're diverse for so many reasons. There is no other person that's you. 
So therefore, your diversity, in a nutshell, describe that. Don't feel pressed or pressure to ignore that fact because you feel like it doesn't align with some broader vision of diversity. It's different than, let's say, disadvantaged status. Social, social, socioeconomically, there are criteria for being disadvantaged, but there all is also always an opportunity to discuss why you believe your experiences may put you at a disadvantage. For that reason, absolutely consider why you are diverse and definitely ensure that you would answer that question to the best of your abilities. The next slide, and we're going towards the oh, next slide is just references. This is where I got this information from. I, I put in the link so you can refer to them. And now I will spend the next, I would say, maybe five minutes or so answering questions. If Dr. Dale would allow me before the website cuts me out, <laughs> then feel free to contact us afterwards if you have more questions. So, okay, first question I see, should we talk more about the what, the why, or the how in our descriptions? And just to clarify, oh, thanks, Dr. Dale. And, and just to clarify, is your question in your descriptions in the activities, personal statement, or secondaries? Personal statement. Yes, okay, that's a great question. So I would say if there is any way you can do all of them, and by any way, I mean you absolutely will. You will do all of them. So which is to say, talk about it. What is it? It's important to know what it is because I really don't care how it made you feel if I don't know what it is. So that's the most important. That can be clear. I volunteered at a homeless shelter. I volunteered at a homeless shelter when I was in college. Now here's the part where your question can actually have, have branches. I volunteered at a homeless shelter in college because in high school this thing happened. Or I volunteered at a homeless shelter when I was in college, and this let me get a job doing this. So the why can actually be very variable depending on the context in which that experience is given. I do believe there are some instances that are just more what I would call road, road signs. I did this because I was there, and this helped me do this other thing. So because of that, if I took a job teaching at a high school, and when I met this kid at the high school, he influenced me to go work at the homeless shelter, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the high school, because the high school is literally just where our story started. So for that reason, there are some experiences that are kind of just pin drops. I just want to tell you this so you can keep following me here. Everything is contextual. And so for that reason, it entirely matters the context in which that experience is given, which will determine the depth and uh, the, the sub substance of the information provided. Um, okay, let's see, let's see. Let me scroll up, scroll up. Do you recommend turning in your application? Oh, wow, they're scrolling up, they're scrolling up. Let me scroll up just a little bit. Do you recommend turning in your application before scores if you haven't taken the MCAT or wait until your scores are back to turn in with them altogether? That's a great question. So here's, here's, um, here's the answer to your question, Victoria. This is some schools will say that they will not look at your application until it's entirely complete, meaning when your MCAT scores get there. If you are talking about taking your MCAT for the first time, this may be true for all the schools. But no, there's different categories of how the school may consider you. So there's the put you aside, quote unquote, which means we saw your application, you may have given it a once over and we put it over here with the other people who don't have everything. And then there's the, we haven't even seen your application until it's complete because we can't even see you. So both of those do not hurt you at all because ultimately the application isn't really seen until it's complete. The second aspect to consider is that if you're talking about maybe taking your MCAT a second time, then there, that's very different. There are some schools who say any score we receive, we will look at that. And those universities, the reason why I know that is because I called them MCAT um, three times here. Let's be transparent, folks. And so there's some schools who, yes, they will look at your application the second they get any information. And if you want them to hold off because you know the next score is better, then in that case, it may be better not to submit, not to press send for your secondary application until that's done. The primary application is different. You actually have to get that verified for about six weeks. So sending that initially is actually entirely fine because the second it's verified, it takes off about six weeks of your life and the rest of your steps can be quicker. All right. Um, let me see here, answer a couple more questions. 
we have oh hey Vegas. Um hey, Erica. <laughs> if we have the end cat and the rest of our except LOR is still considered complete. Like I said, it depends on the school. And I see I wanna you know let Megan have <laughs> okay, Dr. Dale, I see that. <laughs> I mean, the first, let me have lots of awesome questions. Does the personal though. statement have to be completed? To, I it's, I know. Okay, last last question. Last question. I promise. Does the personal statement have to be completed to be verified? Yes, everything in your app in your initial AMCAS application has to be complete in order for you to press submit. Otherwise, it will not let you. It's the equivalent of saying, actually, there's no gas in this car, so it can't move. Okay, I um I pass it to you, Megan. <laughs> oh, great. Thanks, folks. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Nope. Everybody say thank you to Erica. She did an awesome job. I am so thankful for you. I learned a lot. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> before, okay, I I learned a lot too. <laughs> before um, we finish everything up here, I just want to give a couple quick announcements. Yes, definitely make sure you guys start a forum on PreMedStar, and then Erica can help us out and answer some of those questions, maybe, and we can help each other out too on the site. I do want to give a quick shout out to Milan, Madeline, and Aisha for their blogs that they've written this week. They did an awesome job. And also to Holly for being the pre-med of the week. Um, make sure that you guys upload your profile photos on the, on the site so that uh, we keep everything very professional and we get to know each other. And uh, make sure you update your profiles too since the semester just ended. We know lots of things have been going on. And also next Tuesday, we've mentioned the MChat a little bit. Uh, next Tuesday, there's going to be one of the best Kaplan instructors on the MChat with us. So y'all definitely make sure that you take advantage of that and go ask lots of questions, get all your questions answered. And next week, we are going to have a webinar all about financial aid. So the financial aid counselor from the University of Colorado School of Medicine is going to be with us. And it is at, um, yeah, next week's, let's see, I'm looking at the um, chat. I'm not exactly sure what time Dr. Dale do we have a time for MChat on Tuesday? Uh, but next week's webinar will be Wednesday at 8 p.m. again, um, Easter time. And we'll have that financial aid counselor. All right, awesome. I think that is all of our announcements. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, and like Dr. Dale said there, we're not quite sure about what the MChat time is yet. But thank you guys so much for joining us. And um, we'll see you next week. Huge thank you to Erica. She did such a great job. <laughs>